This is problem 6.151, it's on page 359. Because the brace shown must remain in position even when the magnitude of P is very small, a single safety spring is attached at D and E. The spring DE has a constant of 50 pounds per inch and an unstretched length of 7 inches. Knowing that length L is 10 inches and that the magnitude of P is 800 pounds, Determine the force Q required to release the brake. Or the brace, excuse me, not the brake, the brace. All right, so we've got ground down here with a pivot point. Uh, looks like we've got a little bit of an offset member here. Let me uh, sketch this more as they have. And let's see, that goes over to a pivot point. Okay, this may be a little large, but well. And then there's another member that is pivoted here. Connection point there where the two can touch. Remember here where there's a roller, that roller rolls on ground here. So here's our force P acting downward, point D and E, with the spring between the two points. Q over here. You can see what would happen, right? With point with force P pushing downward. It would tend to, to lock together, right? But you'd have to apply some force Q against the spring and against P in order to get this to open up and pivot. Uh, other points and dimensions. Well, this is A, this is a pivot point. D, E, I've got C is down here. B is this pivot point in the back. There's a 20 inch dimension between Q and C vertically. There's a 15 inch dimension from A to Q and a 1 inch offset between C and DE. And finally, a 2 inch offset continuing on back to B. The force in this, or the, the spring constant, K, is 50 pounds per inch of stretch. And right now, the spring is stretched, length DE is 10 inches. So if the free length, L sub F, is 7 inches, then that means that the spring is stretched by 3 inches, okay? So how much force is in the spring? Well, for every inch that it stretched, is 50 pounds, so the total force in the spring then must be 3 times 50 or 150 pounds. Okay? The magnitude of P is 800 pounds. And the question is how much force Q is required to open this brace up and let it collapse. What do you suggest we do? Any ideas? Blow it up. <laughs> Blow it up. <laughs> I'm more constructive than I am destructive. I don't really care for destroying things. I highly prefer to make things that work and last. How about if we take a free body diagram and analyze it? Or maybe we could look at uh, overall uh, forces, right? Because, for example, at C, I can say something about the reaction at C. There must be an 800 pound force here. Notice that C and A are in a line. Let me make sure of that. I think they're in a line. Let me double check. I don't 
think it specifically states or doesn't state that they're in a line? Yeah, but we have to know where P is located. And so I think that's the intention. They're in a line. So from an overall free body diagram of the whole system, there must be 800 pounds here. Notice there can't be any horizontal force at A. Now, notice there could be a reaction here. Let's call it A. Uh, do I want to call it A? Yeah, that's fine. AX. I have a quick question. Sure. Does that say delta X? Yes, delta X. Like the How much the spring is stretched? The teardrop kind of thing? That's a delta. Okay, that's a delta. And then is that a lambda above it? No, that's an L sub F, free length. L sub F. Okay. All right. So, let's take a free body diagram. Which one do you want to take? The bottom part or the upper part? Which do you think would be better? We might need both, right? Who knows? Why don't we just try the lower free body diagram? Because at least I know something about the load. Well, I guess I know something about the load here. It's just I don't know anything about AX, and I'd rather not find it if I don't have to. So I'm going to start with a free body diagram of the lower body. Something like that. There we go. All right. So we know that at point E, there's a force from the spring F sub S like this. We know that at point C, there is at least an 800 pound force. However, there could also be some CX here. We can't assume that there's no horizontal force because look, Q is pushing here, but AX pushes here. C has the potential to also push. Okay. Then what else is there? Well, we have to decide where we are going to apply Q. What I think I will do, uh, this may be overly complicated, but I think I will take, uh, how do they describe Q? I think they describe it as being applied to the pin. Yeah, they don't describe it that way, but they do draw it to the pin. So if I were to draw the pin, there would be force Q on it, and then there would be force from, I'm going to do something a little bit different, there would be force from, uh, let's see, how do I want to call this? CB? Uh, let me call this body one and body two to make it clear. Hmm. So force from body one onto pin B. And there would also be force from body two onto pin B. Notice I've drawn arrows that are curved arrows. That indicates that I don't know the direction of those forces. So forces are vectors that have both magnitude and direction, right? Now, I'm, what I'm saying here with these curved arrows is I don't know how big it is and I don't know what direction it points. Notice that with trusses, one of the nice things with trusses is we've dealt with two force members where we knew the directions of forces and that helped us quite a lot. Here we don't because this is a more general type of problem. Okay? However, there are going to be equal and opposite forces. In other words, there's going to be a force from body or pin B onto body one at this point, you see? All right, are there any other forces acting on body one? I think that's it. If I were to sum moments, for example, about this point, point C, I bet I could figure out the, uh, well, something about FB1. But notice that I can only get one bit, bit of information because think about it. If I sum moments about this point and I know the magnitude of FS, which I do, right? This force in the spring is just 150 pounds. That's no big deal. If I sum moments about this point, the more horizontal FB is, the more that force causes a moment. Now, I can see the moment arm here. In fact, Basically, what a sum of moments about point C would tell me is the magnitude of the horizontal component of FB1. See that? But it doesn't tell me the whole story about FB1. Fortunately, I could sum forces, say, in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. Now, unfortunately, when I sum forces in the horizontal direction, I'll have to include another unknown. But summing forces in the vertical direction should help me find out FB1. So I think this is going to work. So let's give it a shot and see what happens. You ready? 
Any questions so far? All right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Are F1B and FB1 different? They're equal and opposite. That's why I drew their subscripts in opposite orders. Because notice the pin is connected here, right? So if the pin is connected there, then whatever force the pin applies to the body, the body applies equal and opposite to the pin. Okay? Anything else? All right. So I think we can get at FB1. Let's try it. So summing moments about point C, taking counterclockwise as positive, what do we have? Well, CX is out of the way. We've got FS acting clockwise, so it's going to be negative. Everybody see why the moment arm of one inch causes FS to give me a, a clockwise moment about C? Uh, because it's going up. Well, because of, right, because it would tend to rotate the body about yeah. C clockwise. FS? FS would, yes. So FS times its moment arm of one inch. Okay. What about FB1? Well, the only component I really care about, let's see, or is that true? Uh, no, no, it could have a two separate components. So let's, let's break this up. We might not have enough equations to solve this. So uh, F... Real quick, sorry. It's okay, hang on, let me write it down. F1BX, F1, or FB1Y. And break it up into an X and Y component. Go ahead. Um, my first question was not the main question. What did it say inside the parentheses on FS? That's eight One inch. inch. One inch, okay. And uh, how, uh, would you mind explaining how it goes up and to the right if you're not for FS? Okay, it looks like here's the key. This is always the key. Put a pin here. Yeah. Apply the force. Which direction does it make the body rotate, clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, because it's curved, it would go that way. Not because it's curved, because it's offset to the left, it will go clockwise. Okay. You see that? Yeah, because it's offset. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the offset direction that makes the difference. If the offset direction were on the other side, then what would happen? It would, uh, well, if it was on the other side, it would still, oh, oh, and then you're pushing up like that, it would go that way. Exactly, right. There you go. Yep. Good question. I'm glad you're asking. That's good. Any other questions? Um, for the 150, did you just multiply 50 by 3? Yeah, because I know the spring is stretched 3 inches. For every inch of stretch, I get 50 pounds, so 150 pounds. Yep. Anything else? Okay, so let's continue. So, FB1X, I'm off the screen. is it going to cause a positive or negative moment the way I've drawn it? It's going to cause clockwise rotation, right? So minus FB1X multiplied by its moment arm, which is the height. Well, what's the height? Well, from C up to the pin is 20 inches. Okay. What about the Y component of FB1? Will it cause a positive or negative moment? Cause positive, that's right, because it's on the left, it's tending to cause a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. So plus FB1Y multiplied by its moment arm, which would be measured from here over to pin B. So that's three inches. And I think that's it, right? There's only the spring and the force at the pin that cause a moment about C. So that sum should come out to zero. We've got one equation and two unknowns. Notice the spring force is known. If I sum forces in the vertical direction on this body, I'll have Fs plus 800, right? Both of those are acting upward, minus Fb1y. Okay. And I think that's everything equals zero. So this equation is going to yield FB1Y. Since we know it will, let's go ahead and solve it. FB1Y then must be simply 150 plus 800, so that must be 950 pounds. So now that's a known. Now the first equation will yield F1 or FB1X. We'll solve for that in just a second. Let me 
erase the free body diagram of the pin, pin B. So I've got enough space to write my sum of force in the horizontal direction equation. So the horizontal direction, I've got CX. The 800 and FS forces don't appear. And then I have uh, plus FB1X equals zero. So CX and FB1X are going to be equal and opposite to one another. So let's go ahead and get FB1X from here. Uh, let's see, I guess we don't need the free body diagram anymore. I do want to note that CX is to the right and B1X is to the right. Let me just erase the upper part of this. So if we continue with this equation, FB1, or with the moment equation, FB1X, we'll just take this whole term to the other side. So we'll write minus FS, which is 150 pounds, times one inch, that takes care of this term, it's all done, plus FB1Y, 950 pounds, times three inches, that takes care of this second term. And then we pulled this to the other side, we've got to divide out the 20 inches. And that should give us FB1X. So let's see, if I try to do that in my head, can I do it? I don't know, we'll see. So 3 times 1,000 is 3,000. That'd be what, 2,000? Well, we're, we miss 150 from 3,000. In fact, we're going to miss 300 total from 3,000. Bless you. So that would be 2,700. So I need 2,700 divided by 20. So that's 270 divided by 2, 135 from thinking, right? So is the result 135 pounds? Did I get that right? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So FB1X is 135 pounds. All right. So that means CX is actually pointing the other direction with 135 pounds force itself. See, because these two are equal and opposite to each other, okay? So, now that I've figured out some things, let's write them down. I don't want to forget them. I'm going to use green for forces on body one. So CX is 135 pounds. We don't need, we can remember this force in the spring is 150 pounds because we will need it again for point D. Um, I had drawn, it's going to get a little bit messy, let me move Q over. I had drawn FB1X this way and FB1Y this way. All these forces in green are forces on body, you know, BC, BCE. Okay. So if I draw a free body diagram of point B, Let's do it this way, pin B. There's going to be force Q acting on it, and there will also be F1BY. Notice I changed the order of the subscripts because I'm pointing in the opposite direction. Now this is force from the arm onto the pin, not from the pin onto the arm. In the same way, I'd have FB1X, but that's not, or 1BX. But that's not all of it. There's also going to be force from body two onto the pin. So there are some other forces. Let me just make a curve arrow and write F2B, force from body two on pin B. So I don't have enough information yet to figure out how big Q is. I can't assume that the forces from body two onto the pin are the same as the forces from body one on the pin because it's not symmetrical. But I bet that we could make a free body diagram of the upper body and work from there. Or better yet, could we say anything? Uh, no, I was trying to see if we could say anything about the overall, now that we know the CX value, but we don't because we don't know Q, so AX is not something we can get from an overall free body diagram. So we'll have to simply make another free body and figure out the forces acting on the upper body. So I'm going to just include the wheel, 
with the arm, something like this. Oh, you know what? I forgot something. I've made a mistake. That last free body diagram is wrong. I forgot a force. Notice there would be force there also, wouldn't there? So we're going to have to go back, redraw that free body diagram and reconsider it. Uh, that last free body diagram. Wait, would there be because we're... These two points are connected together, aren't they? I'm not seeing anything that connects them and... Think about it this way. What would that spring do? If that spring is pulling with 150 pounds, those two arms are going to tend to close together and they're going to touch at that point, right? Um, but aren't we... isn't it at 7? inches and we're trying to no, it's expand it it's to at 10? ten it's at ten inches right now. The spring is at ten inches. So it's drawn at ten inches? Ten inches? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I missed a force. So we're gonna have to go back and reconsider this free body diagram. Which means I'll probably pause the video, we'll take a break and then was we'll that, pick it back up. Was that not what FS was? No. Okay. FS is a force from the spring. There's also force from body two onto body one, and I missed that force. It's my fault. So F um, B one Y no X, and then C X and the 800 pound force. Yeah. So I missed a force. That's my fault. We'll have to reconsider it. Okay? Well, we take a five minute break. When you come back, we'll pick it up and continue, okay? All right. Let me change my mind one more time. If we are applying enough force Q to release the brace, what does that mean? That means that we're beginning to overcome this, right? So the spring's trying to hold it together, but we're overcoming the spring. That means there wouldn't be any force here. So fortunately, we don't have to go back. I wasn't thinking right, okay? If you think about it, if you think about the limiting case, if there's no force Q, you're going to have maximum force between those two points. And all we're trying to find is the amount of Q such that there is no force between those two points. Now, if you really wanted to get particular about it, you can think about, well, yeah, but what about the fact that as this thing moves and opens up, the spring is going to actually open up farther and more force Q is going to be required to get it to move past a toggle position where it can open all the way. Well, I don't know enough details about this. When, when they say release the brace, I'm sure what they really mean is just to uh, make it a zero force between those two, the, that pinch point, okay? So I think we're okay. The results we have so far are just fine, and I should write them down. We had, we had FB1X and FB1Y, and I did not note their magnitudes, but I know that FB1X was equal and opposite that. So this must be uh, 135 pounds. Anybody remember what we got for FB1Y? Was it 950? I think it was 950. Thank you. Yeah. That's right. 950 pounds. Thanks. So there are the results from last time. So what we were going to do then was draw a free body diagram of the upper body. Like this. And just as before, there would be no force at this pinch point, so that's a good thing. There would be spring force F sub S here. And um, similar to what we had before, I'm going to draw an F, uh, how did I put it, from the pin B onto body 2 in the horizontal direction. And um, I guess we'll go up this time. F, B, 2, Y. Okay. And then force... P at 800 pounds, of course, force FS is 150 pounds, and then the reaction AX. I think that's everything. Let me make sure I haven't missed anything. What I said that you missed is that uh, if we're just opening the brace, then there wouldn't be any force at that point, at that pitch point. So I've corrected myself this time. All right. So let's see, we've got one, two, three unknowns. I think we should be able to solve for them. Probably the best thing to do would be to sum moments about point B, don't you think? Because that would eliminate FB2X, FB2Y. 
and should yield AX immediately, which will give FB 2X, and then we can sum forces in the vertical In fact, actually, we can already sum forces in the vertical direction to get FB 2Y. This should be easy. It would be uh, 800 plus 150, so this is a further 950 pounds. See what I did there? Just summing forces in the vertical direction. And if we sum moments about B, let's write that out, counterclockwise positive for this free body diagram, well B2X, B2Y would disappear. We'd have the spring force, which would be a negative moment, 150 pounds. Its moment arm, let's see, would be the distance from here over to there. So that's a two inch moment arm. Okay. And then the 800 pound force also has a two inch moment arm. Okay. Also a clockwise tending motion. And then AX is counterbalancing it all, so plus AX. And that moment arm would be what, 15 inches, right? So 15 inches equals zero. Okay, so we should be able to solve for AX from this. And that means just take everything to the other side. We already know that 800 plus 150 is 900, so let's, or 950, pardon me, 950 pounds times uh, 2 inches divided by the 15 inch moment arm for AX. And that should give us the value of AX. So we just need 950 divided by 7.5. What do we get? Go ahead. Is that a 2 next to the negative 150 or is that a 1? This is a 2 and that's a 2 because the moment arm is 2 inches from this line to this line. Okay. Except, you know what? You've got a point there. I've made a mistake because I should not just be going from here to here. I should be going from here over to here. And we said that was a further 1 inch offset. You're right. So from B over to P, the 800 pound load, I should have had a 3 inch moment arm. So that means this won't work. i got to try again. So 2 times 150 is 300. These are inch pounds. 3 eighths are 24, so 2400 inch pounds, all divided by 15 inches. That should give us the right answer. Thank you for pointing that out. You're right. Unfortunately, the way I've drawn this, it looks like they're along the same line, but they really are not. FS and P are not collinear. Anyone have a number for me for the value of AX? So from a sum of forces in the horizontal direction, you can see that this must be 180 pounds also. Okay. So the last question is, how much force do we have to apply with Q to pin B in order to get it to the point where this pinch point is basically not touching anymore? Well, Let's see, I wrote B1X, so that's the force from pin B onto body 1. So F1BX at 135 pounds. It's there. F1BY at 950 pounds. It's there. Not surprisingly, we found that FB2Y is 950 pounds. This is the way the pin is pushing up on this body. So the body is pushing down on the pin. FB2Y equals 950 pounds. Not surprisingly, those two cancel each other out okay, for vertical equilibrium. And then finally, FB2X is this way. So F2B x is to the left at 180 pounds. So how much q do we have to apply? Well, 180 plus 135, right? So that'd be what, 215 pounds? Oh, 
or 315. Wait a second. What am I thinking? Above the two? Yeah, 315. Any questions? Does this make sense? Any mistakes you see? Questions?